Hello, Pantheon community. Every month, David Ronick Schlau hosts a special VIP discussion titled Bring Out Your Devs. This takes place in our Discord. And for this content, our VIPs get to ask questions, get to know our devs, learn about their past and inspirations, and discuss their experiences in working for VR. Now, typically, these are VIP exclusive, but in spirit of the holidays, we wanted to share out one of the very first episodes in which we featured senior programmer Steve Clover. We hope you enjoy. Bring out your Daves. Bring out your Daves. Bring out your Daves. Welcome, everybody, to our very first dev live chat. It's an exclusive chance for VIPs to get to know our developers up close and personal. I, Ronick, embracer of death, am your host. With me tonight is your cruise director, Mr. Benjamin Dean, who will, not only, who will not only be monitoring the chat, but also provide all around good cheer. Uh, so without further ado, I would like to introduce tonight's guest. Now, I'm not one to throw around words like legend, but St- senior programmer Steve Clover is certainly worthy of the title. Steve's been in the MMO business for over 20 years. He's credited along with our founder, Brad McQuaid, as being one of the driving forces behind EverQuest, one of the most influential and successful MMOs of all time. He also worked alongside Brad on his on fan favorite Vanguard and brought his skills to Daybreak's free realms. He has a reputation of being an unsung hero, something we're witnessing firsthand now that he's bringing his prowess and experience to Pantheon. Welcome, Steve. Hey, thanks, guys. Hey, Steve. Nice oh. to be here. Happy Good to, to have you. Yeah, for sure. Um, so we're going to kick it way, way back. Uh, oh, uh, sorry, Dave. Can I just interrupt for a second? Um, I, I just wanted to go over with uh, with the audience here as to as to this new show, show format. Um, basically, what we're doing here, we're, we're, as you guys know, we've replaced the the the, um, the dev roundtables, and this chat is is more of an informal chat. It's to, like Dave said, you know, get to know the devs a little bit more. Um, if you click on the chat icon right at the top of the channel uh, where it says dev live chat. There's a little bubble there. You can click on that and you can join right into the dev live chat chat channel. And there you can just type your stuff. And during the show, um, during our little discussion tonight, uh, I'll be going reading your comments and we'll, we'll work some of that in as appropriate. You know, if you have questions, feel free to ask them, you know, keep them on topic hopefully. But, but yeah, we wanted to involve you guys a little bit more uh, in the dev live chat. So, that's the purpose of what we're doing tonight. Sorry, Dave, I rudely interrupted you. I will now turn it back to you. My no, I, I, usually it's me that's interrupting you, so I'm glad that we had a Fair little uh, you know, change of hand there. Uh, so, Steve, I wanted to start out by talking, you know, we're going to, I think the, the way that we're going to handle this show is we're going to kind of go way back uh, and look in the past and sort of talk about, you know, what you've done in, the, in you know, previously to joining Pantheon and then we'll start to look forward and talk about uh, what you're doing here and um, what the fans can look forward to. But I I want them to kind of get to know you a little bit. You know, you're, you're a little reclusive, Uh, you know, you, um, you, you're not one for the spotlight. So we're really happy to have you here, but I want to talk about uh, what, what do you think first got you into fantasy and programming? Um, you know, were there certain novels that you read? Did you play D and D? Where where did it begin for you, both with programming and just sort of the fantasy genre? Oh wow, um, yeah. So for for fantasy in general, um, I mean, I read like The Hobbit when I was, geez, I don't know how old, um, pretty pretty young, um, and uh, you know, quickly followed up by The Lord of the Rings and all that, and that's still my favorite stuff. Um, but, um, anyway, so that's, that's where it started for, for, uh, fantasy. And then, uh, um, basically, you know, I ended up, uh, I ended up going, uh, to a friend's house one day and, uh, he was one of the lucky kids. Uh, his dad owned an Apple II. This was way back in the day. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, I was over at his house and, I mean, he was kind of the equivalent of the kid with the pool, you know, it's like, okay, you want to make friends with these people, you know? Um, and, uh, so anyway, he, he really didn't care about the, the computer at all. So I was sitting there playing on the Apple II, and he really cared about my skateboard. And so he was out skateboarding and I was playing games on the Apple II. So 
I'm flipping through the discs one time and, uh, you know, we were playing the Calabeth and, you know, things like that. Right. But, um, flipping through the discs and I come across, uh, something called Apple basic. I'm like, well, what is this? Is this like another game or something? And, and, uh, my friend was like, I think that's what they use to write these games. And I was like, oh, no way. You know, you can actually make your own games with this. That's crazy. And so that basically I was hooked from that point on and, uh, you know, started, you know, getting into programming at that point, basically. And, uh, you know, off and running since then, because the idea of like making your own game was just the coolest thing ever for me. So, yeah, it basically turned into into that and, you know, going through all kinds of different computers and coding a bunch of stuff and yeah we, so you traded your skateboarding career for uh for for programming absolutely i did yeah wise choice and, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah i'm sure that other guy is not a, a professional skateboarder unless your friend was tony hawk i think we're in pretty good shape like he's the only one <laughs> tony hawk's the only professional skateboarder. <laughs> <laughs> this is the first name you can mind um so did, would, would, he was would, tony no. <laughs> now they mention it yeah That'd be amazing. Uh, would you say yeah. that you're pretty self-taught then? Uh, did you, did you have any professional like, you know, education in programming? Did you take any classes? Um, well, I mean, I, I started doing some programming stuff in college, but honestly at that time I was already, um, way ahead, way into, you know, uh, programming stuff and honestly knew more about, you know, coding than uh, some of the teachers I had. Um, you know, I mean, it's, I was, I started working in C before the, the professor I had, had even learned it and all that. So he was asking me questions about, you know, how to code stuff and all that C. So I, I figured by that point I was, I was probably good to go, but honestly I ended up, um, I was working on a computer science degree, but then I got a job as a programmer. Um, and so basically I ended up saying, well, forget that I don't need the degree anymore because I've already got the job I wanted uh, with it anyway. So, you know, I was off and running and so I never did uh, finish that particular degree. There you go. Uh, it pretty much just basically self-taught. Yeah. So well, yeah. Bronson was saying in chat there too, he was, he was saying that there wasn't no schools for much of that back then. No, it's not like you were going to a university for game development at that point. You know, it's like, I mean, I, you know, remember you know some of the guys that i used to work with started uh, actually you know like teaching some game development courses and stuff like that so it was it was definitely the early days then there wasn't anything remotely like that and programming games was kind of frowned upon it wasn't like real programming and things like that although those people really had no idea because games programming is like about the most challenging i've ever done but you know anyway what Those were, are the best careers. Sorry, Dave, go ahead. No, I was, uh, was going to ask, what were some of the early video games that you sort of enjoyed and kind of influenced you when you were starting to program your own games? Oh, man. Um, were yeah, you a well, King's Quest fan? I loved King's Quest. I, I played some King's Quest, yeah. Um, I, I did, uh, you know, of course, all the Ultimas and stuff like that, the classic, like, you know, Ultima three and killing everybody in the town and all that kind of jazz. Um, but, um, anyway, yeah, it was, it was, uh, it was a lot of that, you know, wizardry, um, and, uh, a lot of different RPGs and stuff like that early on. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, it, uh, it, it went into of course, you know, like, Hey, you know, I, I, I'd, I'd like to make my own RPGs, you know? And, uh, and so, you know, that kind of, that kind of, I don't know, you know, if you want to roll into it here or not, but that, you know, when I met Brad and, uh, you know, he had some of the same interests and that kind of stuff, you know, we started working on our own, uh, you know, stuff together. So yeah, yeah let's talk, uh, about, let's talk a little bit about that. How did, how did you and Brad meet for, obviously I'm sure I'm assuming everybody knows we're talking about our founder, Brad McQuaid. Uh, but anyway. Uh, how did, how did you guys meet? How did, how did that happen? We actually met on a computer bulletin board. They were called back then. Um, you know, you know, you fire up the 300 baud modem 
and uh, and you get on. And it was a it was actually um, you know a, a, a bulletin board that was run by another guy that became a friend of ours. But basically, it's like there were like three or four of us on there, and I think it was I think it was Mike Butler, and it was Brad. And it was me and it was this other guy, Keith, that was running the bulletin board. And so we would talk, you know, um, on there. And then, you know, we just became friends and started getting together. We found out that we were, you know, fairly close to one another. You know, they basically lived in the town next to me. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we started hanging out and, you know, whatever, you know, going to arcades and, you know, and all that kind of stuff. Right. And, and, uh, you know, basically we had a common interest. We both had, I think, Atari computers at the time, Brad and I did. Um, he had a, I think he had a Commodore 64 um, at first, and then he got an Atari computer. <laughs> and so we, we basically just started, you know, like working on programming our own stuff at that point, working on our own game. So let's talk a little bit about War Wizard, uh, especially for people who don't know what we're talking about. How did it come about? What was it? Uh, and and sort of what what was your influence and, and where was Brad's? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, War Wizard, um, it was Brad and I and another guy named Milo uh, who worked on that. And Milo was this, you know, still is this uh, phenomenal artist although he's a rare individual uh, because he can code now uh, he can do art and he can do music and he does all of them at a high level so he's like a yeah he's that kind of person that I you know think like oh my gosh how did he get all that talent but anyway um, Milo was kind enough to do art for us and uh, and basically um Brad and I shared the programming duties. Uh, he was working on, I think at the time, it was, uh, I think, the Amiga version. And I was working on the Atari ST version. Um, and uh, and I did pretty much most of the, the content, really, for the game, too. Um, you know, like creating all the maps and stuff and, you know, placing so- all the, you know, basically like the population and the items and, you know, a lot of different stuff. Right. So, um, so basically, um, we, uh, we worked on that. Um, and, uh, well, what is war? What is war wizard? Like if people, you know, if they didn't know what it was, what would, how would you explain what word wizard was? Cause it, you know, games back then were obviously a lot different than they are now. Yeah. Yeah. Quite a bit. So it was a single player RPG. It was 2d top down. Um, you basically, you know, had like a, uh, you know, a war wizard character that you were, and then you could pick up a couple other, um, you know, uh, characters along the way to help you, you know, in your, in your party. And, you know, you're basically, you know, somewhat similar to like an Ultima, you're running around, you know, on, on the map and there are dungeons and things like that you can go into and, you know, some, some different stuff, you know, towns to go into and you can buy items and whatever and, you know, all that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, I mean, basically a 2d RPG is pretty much what it was at that point, obviously not multiplayer at the time. Um, well, but, uh, there's, um, yeah. there's a few fans of war wizard too in channel here. And then first and, and then others are asking if you're ever going to finish world uh, war wizard too. They've been waiting a lot of years. <laughs> Um, we, no, we never, we never did, uh, finish war wizard two, And, uh, yeah, I don't think that's going to happen, uh-huh. but, um, but, uh, yeah, war wizard, um, we ended up, we almost got published, uh, actually by new world computing at the time. And then, um, you know, they, they actually, you know, we submitted it to them. They sent us a letter saying, yeah, we're interested and everything. And then they had some bad financial downturn, which, uh, ended up shutting that whole thing down. But, um, and it, you know, they were a big publisher at the time. Mm. Um, yeah, might and magic, all that sort of stuff. Right. Yeah. They um, had, they had covers and everything and huge two page spreads and all of the computer magazines. Okay. I remember that. Yeah. They were huge. Yeah. They were big time. But uh, yeah, things uh, their finances took a turn for the worse, and so it never got published, right? Um, so basically, at that point, we turned it into what was called shareware, you know, at the time, 
um, you know, and sold, I don't know, probably a couple hundred copies or whatever. But um, anyway, so after that, we, we switched to working on, you know, what was called, you know, War Wizard 2, right? But it ended up basically just getting to a demo state. Um, and then we put that demo on the internet. Um, and, uh, and basically, that is what ended up uh, pretty much um, landing us jobs, more or less, at, uh, at Sony um, to uh, start work on EverQuest. Because the guy who was running the studio at the time was John Smedley, and uh, he ran across our demo, and he had basically a general idea of, you know, wouldn't it be cool if we could do an RPG that was, you know, multiplayer with a lot of people? Because he was in there playing, I think it was Cyber Strike at the time, um, you know, which was like a multiplayer mech kind of game, right? Where you run around and shoot each other. Um, but he was doing that and he was always interested in RPGs and he was thinking, well, what if we could kind of meld the two together, right? Um, and so he uh, he ran across our demo and called us up and said, you know, would you be interested in coming to work for us and, you know, making... Uh, making a, I have an idea that, you know, maybe we could make a, a multiplayer, uh, RPG. And Brad and I were like, okay, so you want to, you want to pay us money to make games? Like, okay, yeah, I think we'll do that. (laughs) (laughs) So, so as you were starting out from scratch, you know, much like, you know, you know, we kind of did here with Pantheon where you have a sort of small team trying to, you know, get this game out. Talk a little bit about that. What the early days of EQ were like, was like, um, uh, you know, obviously you're both coming in as, you know, this is your first job and you have this big sort of, you know, thing handed to you. What, what how was that? What was that like? How was the pressure? Um, yeah. Talk a little yeah. bit about that. Well, okay. So Smed brought us on. Brad and I were the first two guys on the team. And like I said, Smed kind of had this general, like really high level sort of idea. Like, hey, wouldn't it be cool if we made a multiplayer RPG? And the studio at the time was all PlayStation stuff, basically. Um, they were doing a lot of sports stuff, and um, and that's basically what they understood, right? Smed really liked RPGs and really wanted to do this whole multiplayer thing, you know. And so that was, but that was about the gist of what he had. And then he set Brad and I loose to come up with what the game really was going to be. So Brad and I, our first task was to write a design document. And so we basically co-wrote the design doc for EQ. Um, and, uh, and that, you know, he basically, we couldn't touch anything. I mean, I, I'm, I'm a coder at heart. And so I wanted to start coding things right away. But Smed was like, no, no, you guys don't code anything. Just write up this design doc first. So we're like, all right. Um, but um, the, the thing is, is like, you know, we, um, uh, Brad and I had been, you know, obviously big, like I said, RPG fans all along, you know, through all the Ultimas and the Might and Magics and, you know, all, all kinds of stuff, right? Um, Wizardries and whatever. Um, but uh, the other thing was, is that I started goofing with MUDs, right? Text-based MUDs back in the day, you know, like Moos and Mushes and, you know, Dinkus and, you know, whatever. <laughs> and so... Um, Brad, actually, his reaction to it initially was, that's stupid, it's text, right? And so he didn't have any interest in playing it, right? And uh, and I kept playing him, kept goofing with it, and I was like, I don't know, man, I think it's pretty cool because I'm in here with, you know, like, I don't know, 30 other people, whatever it was at the time, and, uh, you know, we're grouping up and we're running around killing stuff and getting loot and, you know, all that sort of thing, right? And so I was actually the one who ended up getting Brad into MUDs. <laughs> and uh, that, that was before, you know, we started there at, uh, at Sony on EverQuest. And so basically, if I hadn't gotten him into MUDs, you know, I don't know where we would have been, honestly, for that whole thing. Um, because we, we got the experience from, from MUDs seeing what it was like to, to actually play with other people. And, you know, we started, um, you know, seeing what we liked, what we thought was good about it, what we thought wasn't so good about it. And that really kind of helped us when, you know, to take our previous experience with RPGs and everything 
and to combine all that stuff together and say, okay, what do we want to make here? Um, and so, you know, we just went ahead and, you know, did it. And, and, uh, I ended up coming up with, you know, all the list of, you know, the races that we were going to have, the classes that we were going to have. Um, you know, the, I sketched the original, um, map of the all the starting cities named all the starting cities and all that kind of stuff um and uh you know did a lot of a lot of initial work you know that was a lot of uh, you know a lot of design stuff that was at that time um you know like i said just brad and i um before any like you know designers you know with the title came on um but uh anyway so so i i came up with a lot of that stuff um, and, so if we uh, can't pronounce then, the name of the cities, we have you to blame. Is that what I'm hearing? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> we were in a, Which, uh, yeah. Go ahead, Ben. Wait, it's Kinos, by the way. Uh, <laughs> there's your answer, folks. Uh, first is asking which, which mud RPG or pen and paper do you think was most influential when it came to, to EverQuest? Oh, man. Um, what was most influential? Oh, gosh. Uh, well, of course, I didn't mention, you know, we, we also played D&D. I mean, I did the whole, like, you know, hanging out at the library with, you know, the other guys at, you know, lunch or whatever, you know, playing D&D and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, it had gone through all of that, right? Um, so all of that stuff kind of came together um, really uh, in our minds as to, you know, how uh, how we wanted to go about things, right? Right. And, you know, War Wizard played some role in it and things like that as well. Um, you know, a lot of things that we, you know, kind of learned going along that. But um, one of the one of the MUDs in particular, I played quite a few different ones. Brad ended up, like I said, came into it a little late. And so he, he pretty much just played, I think, two. Um, uh, the main one that we played together was called uh, Sojourn. Um, and, uh, and in fact, that game actually played a bit of a role in some of the some of the um uh classes and races that ended up going into eq because i um was playing a uh let's see i played a troll berserker in that and i really kind of wanted to do a berserker but um that class ended up not really going through um that ended up getting kind of shot down a little bit later on when some other designers came in um, but I always loved playing the troll berserker cause it was just kind of crazy, you know, and you would start whacking guards that would walk through and things like that. And you could get yourself killed really easy and all that, but it, it but it was fun. It was like a visceral experience, but, um, anyway, um, but the other thing I had played a lot of on that was a bard. And so that actually had an influence on how I ended up setting up bards for EQ, um, and, uh, but, but the thing is, is that, you know, you could only do like one song at a time and all that kind of stuff. Right. But the whole, um, weaving of songs thing actually came about in EQ because of a bug. And, <laughs> uh, and a lot of the folks, you know, cause when, when I, when I coded that initially, um, it ended up being a bug that it, that it would allow you to have another one kind of still in effect, another song still in effect while the, while the next one started, and so it, but it turned into this thing where, you know, testers were, and, and, and I, and some of the other devs were doing this as a thing. Right. And it became a, a real skill thing where the good bards were able to do like, I think like three at a time, that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. Right. And, uh, and basically once, once that, um, came out that that was really happening, um, a lot of the, uh, well, at least some of the folks on the team, some of the the designers, as I recall, they wanted to have it fixed. They were like, we need to fix that. That shouldn't be that way. It only needs to do one at a time. And I was like, hang on a minute. I mean, this is actually kind of cool because there's some skill involved with this. And the bards that are really good, you know, are able to keep like three going. Ones that are just, you know, average dudes or whatever, maybe can only do two. So I think this is actually kind of cool, you know, we should, you know, maybe just try and keep this in, I think, honestly, and just sort of balance around it if we can, because I, I really liked the aspect of, of a little bit of, you know, player skill involved, you know, and people that, 
people that knew how to use their class, you know, could could do it well, you know. And I just I, I thought that idea was just too cool to kill. That's that's emergent gameplay for you, and and, and Chris Perkins talks a, a lot about that too. Uh, and, and and it ended up, ended up becoming the the defining uh, trait of of a bard. Uh, really, <laughs> it's 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 kind of cool. There were other yeah. classes too that sort of became emergent too. It wasn't wasn't like monk pulling initially not planned or something along that side, but uh, along that line, uh, feign death pulling or something. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, there were there were a lot of things that ended up being emergent. You know that that at various times we we discussed whether or not we should shut that down. You know, and and see. You know, it, well, you know, because because I mean, there were some folks that were like, it shouldn't work that way. That shouldn't be, you know, we need to stop this. And then, you know, others of us were like, hang on a minute. You know, that's that's kind of cool. But- um, and so, you know, I'm some some of those some of those fights went one way and some went the other, you know, in terms of or, or, or arguments or, you know, whatever disagreements, whatever. Uh, in the design process, you know, and I'm just glad some of that stuff, you know, that emergent stuff stuck, you know, and we were able to to keep it in, you know, because because you can go too far with wanting to like tightly balance things and tightly, um, you know, control things and say, oh, well, no, that shouldn't happen. Blah, blah, blah. We're fixing that. Blah. You know, but you got to be careful with that in my mind, um, because the emergent stuff can be some of the coolest stuff that happens. It's like any art form, really. Uh, it, it becomes the the player's game at that point, and I get it because if you're if you're designing the game and spending months or even years creating a game with a, something specific in mind, and then it doesn't go the way that you had initially planned it, but everybody is loving the the other way, that's a that can that can be a blow. That can be a hard hard pill to swallow. But I think you're right too. I think I think. At some point, as with any art, is is that you have to say, "All right, this is now ours. It's no longer mine. This is this is ours to to enjoy and play with as as we like." Right, right. Because it's, I mean, it, I think it can be easy as a designer um, from a from a design standpoint to say, "This is mine. I'm making this," and uh, and and have a very specific vision in your head, right? Um, and that's that's good. But it needs to be tempered in my mind with, you know, the emergent stuff that happens as well, because there are things that happen that, you know, just, you know, regardless of how much you plan and think things through and code things, uh, you know, the best way possible and all of that, there's stuff that players will do that you didn't necessarily see coming. And that's not always a bad thing. I mean, there's obviously the bad side to it as well, but, but there are there are good things that happen as well and things that, that make, um, for, for ideas to make things even better. Before we move, uh, past EQ, I have a couple other questions and then, uh, we'll move on. Uh, are there, was there anything, you know, you're talking about the bard and, and the, the happy accident that happened there. Was there anything that was talked about as you something that you wanted in a game but you lost that battle that you wish had kind of been in game or do you feel like what was in game was supposed to be in game um for the most part honestly um i think smed made a comment at one point that um he was surprised because i think that was like the first and maybe last time he's seen a design doc that has turned into you know um where the game had pretty much everything from the design doc. So for the most part, most of this stuff that, that we had originally come up with made it in. Um, and aside from, you know, like I already mentioned the berserker, I was kind of hopeful that a berserker class would make it in, but, um, but that ended up being, I mean, we had already, I had come up with so many different classes and, and races and things like that. And we, we were up against the wall time wise anyway. So there really wasn't time to do it. Um, but, uh, but that was one thing that I, that I thought would be cool to be in there. Um, I mean, there were other things that just made it in later on, you know, um, I'm actually the one to blame for that whole project monster thing, that project M thing that happened. Um, that, was that, actually, that actually came about um, because I started kind of 
screwing with players one day in guck um i turned myself into a frog lock with my you know gm powers and stuff like that and uh and i I mean i wasn't like you know griefing people or anything like that but i was just messing with people's heads you know because basically you know it was one of those things where you know people were like what the heck you know there's not supposed to be a frog lock up here what is that doing up here you know and and i was just sort of like you know just goofing with people and i think it was bill trost like the lead designer and i that were sitting around just you know he was like watching me do this and we were just laughing hysterically and it was just too much fun and uh and so we were like oh, what if we could put this in the game and um and so we started you know goofing with the idea right um yeah abusing dev powers absolutely um <laughs> <laughs> no i didn't get anybody killed let's be honest um but um but it was just so much fun and you know we thought well what if we could you know how how could we make this so that players could maybe do this but you know you obviously have the problem with griefing and everything and you got players who you know basically end up ruining it for everybody else right but it was glorious for a time, you know? I mean, some people may, may not think that, but I don't know. Me personally, I had a lot of fun with it, and, and I know some others that did. Um, and, uh, you know, it was, just, it was just one of those things, right, that, that, you know, it was just like, hey, what if we did this? And, um, and you know, I always liked, uh, you know, talking to, to Bill Trost about stuff because we, we would, like, ping ideas off of each other all the time, you know? And that's how a lot of the stuff came about, you know? Um, the crafting system, how that worked. And, you know, a lot of different things came about just from us, like, you know, talking, you know, and just, Hey, what about this? What if we did that? Oh, that'd be kind of cool. What if we did this? And, uh, you know, and that's, that's, that's how a lot of things came to be. You know, the minor illusion thing was another thing that I did, you know, when I was just goofing with players, uh, I think I was in Kino goofing with players and turning myself into a barrel and stuff like that. And, you know, kind of like, you know, moving here and there and stuff. And, you know, when players backs was turned, I would move behind them and stuff and just sit there as a barrel and things like that. <laughs> and so, and so we were, you know, and they would turn around and be like, what the heck? What, where'd that barrel come from? <laughs> you know, but, uh, but, you know, I was just having so much fun doing that or being a tree, you know, like out there when the science, sand giants were getting, you know, kited mm-hmm. around and things like that, you know, so yeah. just different things just, just, just for fun, you know, <laughs> Ahead, That's some top level uh, role playing. I can play a barrel. <laughs> see, Absolutely. Tree. See, I just turn. Hey, I, I just turn me. invisible, and I just grief all the players. That's that's my mo. But I think uh, when I look fondly back on like EQ and for me it was EQ OA, like the dev GM events, like you know, I think uh, you know it sort of sounds like you you may have been the the originator of that. Uh yeah yeah. <laughs> So before we move on from EQ, yeah. what's the, what's the what's the proper pronunciation for Basgrim's uh, sake for of Najina? Najina. Najina. There you go. Yeah. You, you heard it here first, or second, or third. Yeah. There were there were a lot of names that were debated over the years as to how they were pronounced, and I just kind of sat there and laughed a little. But you know, there were some people that were pretty diehard about no, it's pronounced this way, and it was like, yeah, well, no. I think, really, we're <laughs> okay. we're already seeing that with with Pantheon too, and and uh, it's kind of an internal and external joke too. Like I think the the dark mirror, hey, we, yeah, the <laughs> mirror and the mer, um, yeah, that came yeah. up in uh, in one of our all team meetings not, well, uh, I, a couple I of think, weeks ago. I think internally we're still trying to. Well, actually, I shouldn't say that. CP will come after me. Um, well, 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 that's the, that's ahead. what he was saying too, though. That, that, in that call where um, where we were talking about the dark mirror, dark mirror. Um, that's one of the things that Chris Perkins had said too, is, is, you know, at, at some point it, be, that's part of the fun. It becomes, you know, the player's game and, and their pronunciations can be just as acceptable. Um, yeah. So, I mean, we, we, yeah, we have our standards, you know, this is how we say it, but and you can call it whatever you want. Right. <laughs> what do you, what do you yeah, think? If it gains enough influence, you just got to roll with it, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> What do you think is the biggest takeaway from the EQ t- from the EQ days of the, you know starting up that would be relevant to us as a team? What do you think are some things that you've learned that that would be good for us to hear? Oh my, uh, I don't know. That's pretty. That's pretty broad. 
Um, What's your best I piece mean, of advice? Best piece of advice to who? To, to, to us? To or us to, as the team, as somebody who's gone through this. Oh, gosh. Well, um, I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of things that that are are, are I think, pretty key. I mean, one of the things that I thought was really key about EQ is the team we had was was fairly small um, as well. But, you know, you, uh, one of the big keys with it is is pretty much everybody on the team was was just really passionate about making the game that they wanted to play. Mm. Um, and so that was that was a huge thing. Right. Because we were all getting together and we were all just as just as excited about playing this thing as anybody else. Um, and, and it was one of those things where it was like, you know, it wasn't about money. It wasn't about like trying to please other people and whatever all it was about trying to make something that we actually really wanted to play. Um, and we were super passionate about it. And, you know, you had like, like I mentioned, Bill Trost already. Um, there were a number of people on the team, you know, d- the designers, especially who had played a lot of D and D and things like that. Bill Trost had made a lot of his own um, campaigns and stuff in D and D, and another guy Tony had as well, um, and and they brought a lot of that stuff that they had been so passionate about over the years, creating their own campaigns. They brought a lot of that into into EverQuest, and it became you know part of EQ. Um, and they just poured into the lore and things like that. I mean, I had, I had done some things like, you know, when I was initially coming up with spells, you know, and different names for things like that, I thought, you know, if this is like a, a living, breathing world, some of these spells are actually created by people, you know? So what, you know, I mean, we should put in some, some different, you know, names and things, you know, for flavor. And so, you know, I came up with like stuff like Eye of Zom and, you know, whatever, <laughs> Okiel's Chant or something. And, you know, like, um, obviously like for bard songs, you know, right. Somebody wrote these at some point. Right. So a lot of it was going to have names that, you know, just helped the players understand what it was right away. Right. But, you know, like Cello's Accelerando, you know, I thought, you know, that's just good flavor to it, you know, because it makes it feel like a real, world you know instead of it being uh spell a you know spell b whatever you know and, yeah. and all that you know and so i came up with some of these different names for you know these guys that you know may have been these great bards these great you know like you know magicians or wizards or whatever you know in 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 the game history right um i didn't really write anything about them i just came up with their names you know and then the designers who came in um, you know, Bill and some of the other guys, they, they then, you know, fleshed some of that stuff out, you know? So, so you, you, you actually get, you know, a little bit more flavor, you know, to the world with stuff like that. Um, and, and it's so easy, you know, to just do, you know, this is a generic spell name, you know, this is a generic ability name or whatever. Um, but, but a little bit of that at the very least, a little bit of that, I think adds a lot of flavor for, you know, this is so-and-so's song, you know, or, you know, a, a wizard spell that was created by this wizard, you know, called this, you know, that kind of thing. Um, I, I just think that was really good. But, um, but one of the things that, that honestly was, was key too, is that um, later kind of a little bit into the development uh, we started playing uh, some UO when it shipped out Ultima online. And that honestly, I mean, they, they, there were things that they did well and there were things that we, we also thought they didn't do so well. And one of the things that, that basically cemented something for us was when I got in, you know, and I'm, and I'm crafting my own gear, right? I, I created my own sword. I crafted my own armor and all that. I put all this stuff on. I head out, you know, to do some adventuring. And all of a sudden the screen starts like slowing down. I'm like, oh, this is weird. What's going on? And about a hundred guys run on screen and like poor, poor me to death, right? <laughs> They're just like, boom, 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 you know? And they took 
all of my stuff, right, that I had just spent forever, like, mining to get the ore and then crafting and all this kind of stuff. And I was so jazzed that I created my own gear, right? And then, yeah, I got completely pwned, right? Um, within, you know, like 15 minutes or something of leaving the town. And basically at that point, you know, my, my feelings of being like super excited that I was going out adventuring with this gear that I crafted myself and how cool that was got immediately killed by a bunch of people who just, you know, were out pea killing for fun. Um, and they didn't even need my gear. They were way higher level. And they took all of it anyway, right? <laughs> Just to be jerks. And I saw that, you know, and I experienced that. And I said, that will not happen in our game unless it's consensual. Mm. That absolutely will not happen. We will not have PvP like that. And so that really cemented in in my mind for sure and in our minds in general that um, this game – that we were making was going to be PVE for the most part. And then we were going to put in some consensual PVP, but that was not the focus of the game. And it was primarily that because honestly, for me, that, um, that basically ruined UO for me, that experience. And, and I know other people that had similar experiences. Yes, and on. so, so that kind of griefing, um, was just never going to go into EQ. Because basically we wanted to create a game that items mattered, your leveling mattered, your time spent mattered, your crafting, you know, of gear and things like that, it mattered, right? And people are spending time doing this stuff and all of that hard work and all of that effort should be rewarded, not stripped away within 15 minutes, right? And so... Anyway, that that had crystallized a lot of things. And so I think, honestly, for me, that is still true, you know, going forward, um, you know, and and just uh, obviously the other big key thing is the game really, in my opinion, needs to be, you know, we, 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 we basically coined the phrase of a massively multiplayer online game, right, um, with EverQuest. And that was the goal. We wanted it to be massive. We wanted it to be not just a couple of people running around together, not just one person running around in the world by themselves, right? It was supposed to be you're in the world with at least a couple thousand other people, and you're going to be running into those people, and you're going to be grouping with them and associating with them and making friends and you know, making guilds together and all that kind of stuff. Right. And I think honestly, and I, and I think a lot of the players probably that are following Pantheon now probably agree that more recently games have strayed away from that, right. Where they're still technically called MMOs, but they've, they've gone a different path in terms of more of a single player kind of experience. And that's not something that we wanted to create with EverQuest. Um, we wanted it to be where you were dependent on other people. And as much as you could be dependent on other people, um, the better the game would be, really. Because the game really, at its core, needed to be about relationships with people. Totally. And it's amazing that we're talking about this, you know, 20 years later and what, you know, the similarities between what was happening then and what we're trying to do now, even from like talking about the passion that you guys had as far as play, making a game that you wanted to play to, you know, even the lore and the, you know, the naming of items, you know, JN obviously is a big part of the 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 core of this game and what makes it so unique. So it's, it's so interesting uh, 20 years later that, you know, we're sort of gone full circle and heading back to that situation um yeah 
I, I was going to comment on that. I was going to say the exact same thing. The 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 key elements that, that you brought up there, the, the passion, the, the people. Um, and in a way, now that we're living in a day where, where the internet is even bigger and, 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 and social discussions are even bigger and things spread a lot more, it's, it's not just the people that have come on board to help make Pantheon, and all of them have been just as passionate um, ever since, since since we started we, we've always had people saying hey can i help how can i help um but it's the community community too like all, all of the people in this channel all of the people uh, uh following us on on facebook and you know posting in our various channels and whatnot there's so many people that have that kind of passion now so it's like this huge phenomenon that's that's kind of happening again from like tw you know 20 years later so it's 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 really cool. Yeah, it sort of brings yeah. me to to my next question, and that's sort of what 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 brought you to Re Visionary Realms in the Pantheon. What was the driving force behind you joining the team here? Um, well, uh, I had kind of keep kept tabs on on what was going on, off and on anyway, um, with Pantheon, and you know, really, I mean, I, I. I, I was interested in the project because, for one, I think it is trying to capture um, what, at, at least, basically, a, a vision that is very similar to what we were trying to do with EQ. Um, it's it's not going to be a clone of that game. Um, it, we're not really interested, I think, in making a clone of EQ exactly, but but we want to make a game that's faithful to that vision. Um, and, uh, and so I was, I was drawn to that, uh, aspect of the game. Um, obviously I've known Brad since, you know, I think I was 15, he was 14 or something like that. Um, goes way back. Uh, Mike Butler as well at the same time we met. Um, and, uh, he's, he's on the project as well. And so, you know, and and uh, and so I knew that there was that interest in making that kind of game. I, I, I'm I'm not particularly particularly interested in getting involved in something that is a massive team being done um, primarily for money, um, you know, and and that whole kind of experience. I mean, obviously, this industry, you know, obviously you have to make money. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of big companies involved that are interested in in making a lot of money and and if you make a game that is you know with if you make a game with people that are really passionate about that game it turns into something or can turn into something that's really popular right when it's a passion project there's been a lot of games that have that that's happened with um, things that, you know, the guys were just super passionate about. I mean, you've you got lots of games like Minecraft and, you know, tons of other things that just like exploded. Right. But they started out as something that was a passion of of that, you know, individual or small team or whatever making it. And and honestly, those I think uh, a lot of indie stuff nowadays is is really where you find like the newest, coolest, you know, or the next thing. Right. Because in the industry itself, you have a lot of big companies who are really afraid to try something new. Um, they, they're they interested primarily in taking the safe road. And I can totally understand that. Uh, it makes perfect sense, right? You make another game like X, right? Okay, what's the coolest thing right now? All right, let's make a game like that. Um, but unfortunately, some of that development can be primarily they're making it for the money. They're making it to, you know, try and succeed, try and, you know, gain as much money as much, you know, whatever. And so in some cases, you've got things like that. And I think the games suffer for it, honestly, um, because if you have people that are not passionate about what they're working on, um, the, the game just just straight up suffers in my opinion. Um, it's but, but Pantheon seemed to be a project where people were interested. Uh, they weren't interested in just milking people for money. They were interested in making a game that they wanted to play that they thought 
is not being made currently, right? That there is, there's actually a market for this and it's what we want and we're going to make that game, right? And so that's, that's some of the stuff that drew me uh, to being a part of Pantheon. Right on. Ben, were you going to say something? Um, no, it's, it's irrelevant now, but uh, just to take a question from, from Dark Mask, who's, who's asking, um, were, you, were you following Pantheon from the beginning? Uh, how, how long were you following it before you came to the conclusion to join up? Oh, gosh. Um, yeah, I heard about it in the beginning, in the, in the very beginning. Um, and, you know, I mean, at the time I was, I was still working, I think I was working for SOE at the time, uh, Sony online. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I mean, I was, I was very much involved, you know, with, with my work there and everything. And so, um, I, uh, I wasn't going to be, you know, uh, jumping into it at that point in time. And Brad, I think initially, um, it was starting it up in his house or his garage and, you know, and, and it wasn't, it, it was, it was just an initial seedling of things, right? It wasn't something where I could quit a really good job and, yeah. and switch over to this and, you know, still continue to feed my family and, you know, and all that kind of stuff. Right. So it was more just watching it from the sidelines and interested what, in what Brad was doing and all that. Yeah. It, it um, was, so, uh, sorry, go ahead. And so, yeah, just following a little bit here and there over the years and seeing what was going on. So, yeah, yeah. And the, it was, um, it really was that. Um, it was shortly after uh, a round of layoffs at SOE and one of those first uh, first meetings, well, the first few meetings was in Brad's garage. And, and I remembered that I, I was looking for, for work again too. And I'd reached out to Brad and, um, ended up using my frequent flyer miles to get there. Cause I was, uh, you know, I was at that point where it's like, I, I can't afford a ticket, but I got frequent flyer miles, but yeah, it was, uh, who did we have there? We had like Tony Garcia. Um, we, we had, oh, yeah. um, uh, uh, a whole bunch of people. Noel Walling, I think was initially in there. Um, Salim maybe. Salim, yeah. Salim, Salim was, was man. He was a, he was a heavy, heavy contributor right at the beginning. Yeah, that was, uh, he, he really did some hard work. I remember spending, we, we were probably putting about 80 hours a week into the Kickstarter and Salim and I would, uh, we would just literally just stay on the phone the entire time, just throwing ideas back and forth and talking about what we're going to do next with this Kickstarter. And yeah, it was, uh, there were long hours, but yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. All right, Ben, we'll save yours for when we do your... Yeah, uh, yeah, dev, got way off track there. Chat. All right. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, no, I, I, you know, because I, I obviously would love to, t to get on Vanguard too, and we don't really have time, so I want to yeah. just kind of talk about what what you're working on for Pantheon. Uh, the chat is foaming at the mouth to hear about banking, but obviously I want to hear about the death mechanic first. So, so, so oh, talk, okay. to, uh, and Ben, you can obviously be the, you know, the gauge of what we can and can't say, but talk about what went into programming the, the, what, what are we calling it? The near death? What was it? Near death experience. Yeah. yeah the near death. Or not near death experience. <laughs> near death experience. What, yeah. what are we calling it? Near death mechanic. The, the near death mechanic. Yeah. Yeah. I call yeah. it the near death experience. There we go. Absolutely. Yeah, well, they'll be frequenting it a lot, I think. So some more than others, but yes. <laughs> let's let's talk about what went into programming it and uh and what what exactly is it a little bit. Yeah. Okay, well yeah, feel free, Ben, to like stop me from I don't know. Oh Adam's gone into yeah, Adam's got into good detail about uh, about that. So I, Okay, yeah. Yeah, we'll just kinda go yeah, more into the programming so, side of it. Yeah. So um Basically, you know, when I when I came on to the team, um, the death mechanic at that point, at least the way the code was, was more or less an FPS kind of a death mechanic where, you know, you, you run out there, you get killed and then you repop back at the base or whatever, you know, and then you run back out again. Right. And and so, you know, I was playing that, you know, initially in the first I think, couple of days I was on the project, you know, and, um, I'm looking at it going, well, is this what we're planning on doing? This is not what we're planning on rolling with. Right. And they were like, Oh no, no, we need to actually code the thing. So, um, so ended up, uh, uh, being the one, you know, to, 
I, I guess I, you know, sort of volunteered myself really, um, just by commenting on it and wondering when that was going to get done. Um, so basically the, the idea with the, with the near death mechanic is that you, um, when you, uh, well, see, going back to EQ, you would, you would get knocked unconscious and, you know, the bar would go purple and all that sort of thing. Right. And you couldn't, you couldn't do anything at that point other than, you know, pretty much die, um, or hope to, to, to regen out of it and then pop back up again and run a little bit more, you know, and that kind of stuff. Um, but, uh, um, anyway, with, with this mechanic, uh, essentially once, once your health gets reduced to zero, um, the bar does go purple, um, and you enter what we're calling near death, um, the near death state. And basically in that state, you're not unconscious like EQ. Um, you can crawl, uh, at a slow rate at that point, And you're basically bleeding out while you're doing it and all that sort of thing. Um, but you have some sort of a chance to try and, you know, drag yourself away maybe from the combat, you know, and let other people, you know, maybe, uh, you know, take the brunt uh, of things, but basically you, uh, you get, you get dropped to the, the bottom of, of, you know, the, the list in terms of like the, uh, the NPCs being interested in you and all that kind of thing. If there's other people around, you know, they're fighting them, they'll tend to go after them instead. Right. So basically you have a fighting chance to some degree, um, to not die. Right. Um, and you can kind of try and drag yourself away and yeah, people can heal you. And, and there's also, um, uh, a mechanic where people can more or less like, uh, I think we're calling it bandaging, um, or first aid. I'm not sure exactly. I don't know if we've decided fully, but, um, but essentially you can, you can then right click on that person and then you'll start, um, bandaging them. Right. And then, um, you know, eventually, you know, you can bandage them out of it. Right. But it doesn't take any bandages or anything like that. Cause we didn't want to put on, um, you know, people requiring items for, for this and all that kind of stuff. Um, and multiple people can work on bandaging, you know, you at the same time and all that to try and speed things along. Um, and, uh, and yeah, um, uh, so basically if, if they, if they can end up bandage bandaging you out of this or somebody heals you out of it, then, you know, you're, you're back up and, and, you know, in the fight again. Right. Um, uh, and so there won't be any bandages in the bank, right? There, <laughs> there won't be any items required for it. Um, it's just a mechanic that you can just turn on, right? Basically by, by clicking on a player who needs to be bandaged. Um, and that, that's really only for the near death time period. You can't do it. At, I mean, it's not like a free heal or something like that when players are, are not in near death state. Um, but anyway, so, but if, if they don't bandage you out of that and let's say you're fighting solo, um, and no, you can't bandage yourself. Um, mm -hmm. you, uh, you basically can just crawl at, at that point and hope for the best. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> and if not, if you're alone and the monster keeps bite, keeps biting you, keeps whacking you, whatever, um, you're probably going to die. And so basically you'll go through your purple bar, you know, which is a percentage of your full health and all. And then, um, and then you, you, you'll actually die. Right. Then you basically have the option at that point to release. So you'll, you'll get a little dialogue that asks you want to release from, from death. And it's at that point where you will drop a corpse and, uh, and you'll, you'll drop, um, all of the bags that you have and the gear um, that's in your general inventory and that kind of stuff. Um, you're, we made the decision for you to keep uh, the, the gear that you have equipped. There's some exceptions to that. And the designers can control like certain items can be left on the corpse or not. And, you know, different things. Right. But in general, your equipment stays on you. So you're not quite doing the naked corpse run. Um, so you have a little bit more of a chance than that. Um, but 
you're you are leaving your gear and and the stuff that you're carrying around in your general inventory is stuff you know i mean it's stuff you've looted it's it's all the stuff in your bags that you need for various things it's it's maybe ore that you've mined it's you know your pickaxe for you know mining the ore and you know all kinds of stuff and and basically like you know i i really wanted to see okay what is that death mechanic going to feel like once you get into the game you know and so you know i was excited to you know to jump in and play it and everything you know and and my experience is that is that you know it's 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 a lot better than you know obviously what we had before because you really need some form of um you know a mechanic that will make the player not want to die uh to ideally to to fear death at least to a degree right we don't want to shut that down and you know and make you you know, never want to leave town and, you know, and all that sort of thing. But there should be danger, you know, to the world because some of the funnest moments that I personally had in EQ was, you know, skulking around somewhere where I didn't belong, you know, and trying to safely make my way, you know, from Kinos out to, uh, you know, like, East Commons or something or, you know, off to Freeport or something like that, right? And, you know, sneaking around the zone and trying to, like, get a, get away from, um, you know, all of the, the crazy monsters that you would meet along the way, right? Um, and that, but that was fun, right? At least to me, that was fun because there was real danger involved, you know? You could get killed and you could lose your stuff and that wasn't fun to lose your stuff, you know? So it made you more um you know you know worried about the stuff that was around you and more conscious of your environment and that to me anyway was was a fun experience and so uh, hopefully we can bring at least some of that back for this you know that, that there will be real danger you know in the game not that it will prove you know once again we don't want to make it so that it prevents people from you know, ever leaving town, ever exploring, you know, any of that, because it it needs to be about exploration too, but there should be danger. Can we talk a little bit about, um, some of the other things that you're working on? Uh, you know, for instance, obviously the chat wants to know about banking. Huh? Yeah. Well, what do you want to know about banking? (laughs) Uh, I mean, it's, 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 it's basic banking at this point, you know, I mean, we'll, uh, you know, you can put coins and items and, you know, all that in the bank and, and, um, you know, it's, it's, it's nothing like, you know, uh, crazy. And, and as far as like, you know, all the guild banks and the shared banking and all that kind of stuff and regionals and whatever people are interested in, um, that's currently not supported, but it will be. Um, it's just, it's just a matter of priorities at this point. And there's a lot of other things that are more important than getting that stuff in at the moment. Um, sorry if anybody is like really jonesing for like shared (laughs) banking and all that, but, um, but it'll come, don't worry. Um, but at this point, you know, you're going to be able to, you know, store your gear and that stuff will definitely be in there. Uh, what, so what about, can we talk about guilds at all? Have you been working on the guild system at all? Mm-mm. Okay. We can't talk about guild. <laughs> not, not about, not about the design, but, so, uh, but yeah, if you have any, any experience about, about <laughs> never mind implementing hey, guilds, <laughs> I, tr- I tried, I tried. Well, let's, let, I'm going to name, I'm going to name some subjects that, that Steve may or may not be working on Ben. And you could tell me whether he can talk about it. Spot, spot and channel. He's like, and I think you have a call. <laughs> oh, gotta go guys. <laughs> yeah. So can we talk about, uh, some of the UI? Well, you, let's see. So you've done some of the UI cleanup for sure. You've, you've done like the support for negative stat values and skill modifiers, independent of core skill levels on a buffer yep. gear. Right. Uh, you've done yep. some general sort of quality of life improvements. Um, I guess, what are some of the challenges you faced when doing them in the past? How about that? And how do you plan on, uh, you know, how do you plan on not doing that during Pantheon or what, you know, I guess I'm trying to come up with a way that Ben will let me ask these questions. 
Yeah. Um, yeah. Don't, don't, don't anybody like get your knickers in a knot over quality of life. Um, that's, <laughs> that's, I mean, basically we're talking, you know, I, I've been doing a lot of fixing bugs. I've been doing a lot of things that, you know, for, you know, UI related stuff, stuff that just needs to get in there to prepare us for, for PA. Right. Um, uh, we're not talking like we're putting in a bunch of like stuff to turn this into wow. That's not what we mean when we say quality of life just in case anybody's panicking um as great as that game is that's a different game um and we're not interested in turning this into something where you know you are um you know you know jumping in the dungeon finder with random people from different servers and you know and all that sort of thing that's that's not what we're interested in um so uh anyway but um basically working on a lot of things that that are really for getting us getting us to PA first and foremost right now just stuff basic stuff that just just needs to work and work a little better and and all that so um, that's that's really what I'm focused on at the moment because you know we're uh, we're, we're really that, that's our primary focus right now um, there will be lots of other bigger things uh, later on and and to answer a question that's come up multiple times here, I guess. Uh, yes, I am working full time on this right now. This full time Pantheon. I'm just cranking away. Is there anything in, in that same Sorry, vein of question? And I, um, Baz Grimass asked a, a good question earlier on, uh, prior to Pantheon, uh, were you working on anything else like a, um, if, if, you know, I don't want to ask too personal of questions either. So feel free to, not to comment, but, uh, but I think he's just kind of asking what you've been up to. Yeah, that's. Uh, I don't know how much time we have. That's actually kind of a long story. <laughs> we can save it for yeah. part for part two. How about that? Because we don't have that much time. Um, what What are you doing to pre- like? Are, is there anything in particular you are working on as far as preparing the game for pre alpha that you can talk about? And uh, how, what are your thoughts on on how that's progressing? Um. <laughs> Like I said, it's been a lot of uh, somewhat smaller stuff. Um, you know, like I, I just put in like a radial endurance bar for, you know, when you're like when you're climbing or something or sprinting, you're using endurance. And so now we have a radial bar that pops up. And, you know, when that's when that's going down, you know, you'll see this bar up and then it fades out when it's not, you know, being used anymore and that kind of stuff. Um you know, so that's 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 what we mean when we say quality of life, right? And hopefully that doesn't offend anybody. But um, uh, anyway, there's there's um, yeah, various various different you know UI things that I've been working on, um, different things, just gameplay stuff, um, and and you know a lot of bug fixing and things like that. We're just trying to get things tightened up so that uh, hopefully we'll be good to go, and some of you guys can help us and. Uh, get us uh, a little further in testing and all that. So I have a, a few community sort of topics slash questions, uh, and that's how we'll sort of end this thing. Um, and I'm going to give some shout outs here. Art of Ash wants to know, uh, what has changed from the programming perspective of coding and sound and graphics since EQ Vanilla was put together in 99 and how will it benefit Pantheon? Oh, Wow. Um, well, like questions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, when we, okay, to put things in perspective, when we first started EQ, the graphics engine, it was 3d, but it was software 3d. There were no, there were no, uh, actual 3d cards at the time. And, uh, and we were one, actually one of the very first projects that 3d FX, um, wanted us to, to start developing for their card. Um, you know, and, and they had this, this 3d card that they were making. And so we were like, yeah, absolutely. You send us some free cards and we'll, we'll work on this. Uh, and so, you know, we ended up turning it into, um, required, um, you know, 3d card, you know, after that. Right. Um, but so things have changed just a little, um, (laughs) since. 
Yeah, that um, was kind of a big question. We can probably do a whole topic on that some other time. I, I, I like how Damask put it. Describe technological developments of the last you 20 years That's and 500 a, less. <laughs> maybe what we'll do is maybe we'll have Steve talk uh, in a newsletter at some point about some of that stuff. That'd be kind of an interesting, like, bigger article I'd be, I'd be into reading about. Um, Walking Waste wants to know, what's your opinion on Unity as an engine for developing an MMO compared to other engines, say like Unreal Engine 5? What's the strengths and weaknesses of them? Oh my. <laughs> Another small question. Yeah, right. Um, in my opinion, honestly, any any canned engine like Unity or, or, uh, or Unreal, um, and I've used both now, um, they're, they were never really intended to, to to support MMOs. They've come a long way since then. Uh, initially, when we we were starting work on Vanguard, we were using um, Unreal 2, I believe it was. And uh, Tim Sweeney was like, you want to do what? <laughs> um, you know, and, and he came out and we talked to him in the office, you know, about what we were interested in doing and how the networking needed to work, you know, and stuff. And we needed to support all these players. And I think if I remember correctly, Tim's response at that point was like, that's never going to work. It's, you can't do that, you know, <laughs> whatever. All. Um, you know, so we, we had to do a lot. Um, and they, they, they were great. Tim was awesome. And, uh, and his team was great in helping us as much as they could, um, to get things up and, you know, rolling, but we had to do a lot of custom stuff to get, um, you know, to get these engines to support something like an MMO, uh, that's not really what they're primarily intended for. Let's just say it that way. And so there's a lot of work that has to be done to make them uh, actually perform um, to an MMO level. Um, they're fabulous. And they were originally created for things like shooters, you know, first person shooters, of course, you know, for like Unreal, you know, um, you know, and all that sort of stuff. And so they work great for that sort of thing. And they work great for a lot of games and they're, they're excellent engines and they've come a long way. Um, they were just never really started with the intent of MMOs. And so, um, you know, we, uh, we have had to, you know, even, even with, uh, with Pantheon here, like you guys have heard, you know, with Kyle's, uh, networking code that he's done. Um, you know, really, I mean, it's, it's networking code that, you know, the stuff that, that comes with unity is great, but it's not necessarily intended to run an MMO on. Uh, and so, you know, it, it, for handling the traffic that we're talking about with a game like this, um, you really, you know, we needed to, to, you know, there, there's a lot of work you need to do to make these things roll. So, um, thankfully Kyle totally loves all the networking code stuff and is great at it and has developed a fabulous engine and we've got that into the game now and, uh, and things are, are, are working pretty well at this point. Okay. Moving on to the next one. Uh, John Petrucci wants to know in fleshing out, I don't know if you can answer this one, but we'll try in fleshing out the perception perception system of the flags checks etc that are associated with that particular system along with all the comp completed quests and whatever other tags associated with each character's progression and exploration does it create a potential for the system to become bogged down and lag while trying to process and perform checks while moving throughout the world um i well there are a number of systems that can cause problems with MMOs. Uh, it's it's just it's just the nature of the beast with these MMOs. And the more complex systems get, and the more they have to like check to see, you know, um, who's around you, what you know, uh, what they're you know doing, how far away they are, um, you know, what you're your faction uh, is with them. And, you know, the more it has to check all that kind of stuff, obviously the more um, stress that puts on the whole system. Um, so, you know, but, but I mean, we know this going in, there's, there's, uh, you know, a, a lot that has to be done to make this stuff perform it. And some of it, you know, is stuff that really just needs to be tweaked. Honestly. Um, it's just, it's just stuff that, 
that, you know, sometimes you need to get enough people banging on to, to find like where the performance bottlenecks are. And, and, you know, and it makes you reconsider certain things like, okay, maybe this needs to be tweaked a little here and there. And, you know, this needs to be, um, optimized here and, and all that. So, um, basically just to put it sort of generally, um, it's, it's, uh, yes, but you know, with MMOs, a lot of things are that way. Right on. Uh, Radigar TV wants to know, uh, for someone who's brand new to the game industry and wants to eventually design boss mechanics or quest, where would you suggest someone to start at? Um, if you just in general for folks that want to be involved in the games industry, my best advice for you, honestly, is to, um, work on this stuff in your free time. Um, whether it is, you know, if you want to, if you think you want to be a programmer, start coding in your free time. And my best advice for that is start working on something that you find interesting or fun and preferably something that is small, right? Don't, don't jump into programming. Oh, don't do that. <laughs> um, just, you know, start with something small, start with a card game or something, you know, start with something that, that is fairly bite sized so that you can actually, actually produce something and not get discouraged by how big it is and how difficult it is and all of that. Um, but, but work on something that you find fun because at least for me, that makes it way easier to learn. Uh, and it makes it a lot more beneficial, but essentially if you are working on stuff on, in your free time and if, and if I were hiring, uh, you know, coders, artists, uh, designers, whatever it may be. And I looked at two people that both had let's say they both had degrees, right? Oh, okay. They were both computer science majors and whatever. Um, they both have, you know, basically similar skills and all that kind of stuff. I'm interested in the guy that has been working on a game in his free time that has created his own app or created his own, you know, whatever little game, you know, web game, whatever it happens to be. Um, because if you can show that kind of stuff, to to somebody in the industry it says a lot for you as a person that you're a self-starter and that you actually enjoy this stuff that you're not just hey i heard i can make a lot of money doing this my dad told me you know so and so makes a bunch of money so i guess i'll do programming and you know i've met people like that that really hate coding and don't get into it if you don't like it and your best way to find out if you like it is do it in your free time. Don't, you know, just jump into a computer science degree. Um, start coding in your free time. See if you like it. Because if you don't like it at all, drop it. It's not worth being involved in coding and doing it as a job if you don't like it. That's great advice. I wasn't going to take any questions from the chat, but Marak has a good one. What mechanic of Pantheon are you most excited about? What mechanic of Pantheon? Oh my gosh, that's kind of a broad question. Um, no, one of the things that has been, you know, oddly enough, just really fun for me at this point with stuff that's currently in the game is the climbing. Um, it's just been oddly satisfying, like climbing stuff, trying to get my skill up and things like that and climbing up, uh, uh, you know, this area that looks kind of interesting and, and finding something up there, you know, and it was just like, oh, wow, that's super cool. There's an NPC up there who, you know, what's he doing up here? And, you know, and, and that kind of stuff. And that's been super fun. Um, you know, I mean, not you know, that, that's, that's not, that's not a mechanic. That's like, you know, the core of MMOs or anything like that, but it's something, you know, it's something new or a little bit new anyway, that's being brought into MMOs to my knowledge. And, and it's just, I don't know, it's, it's just really fun even right now. And, and we don't even have anywhere near, you know, all the content and all the stuff that's going to be planned, you know, to make it even more fun. But just at this point, it's just been enjoyable, you know, just, just goofing around with and stuff like that. Right. And, and, you know, 
I mean, you know, you're going to be able to climb up to places and find like ores and things like that, that you can mine that, you know, you maybe couldn't find down below. And, you know, you're going to be able to maybe find a cave up there that, you know, you can, you can go into and, you know, have, find another, you know, like little dungeon or something or, or whatever. Right. And it's just that kind of, or, you know, or, or find a, an NPC that gives you a quest or, you know, whatever that kind of stuff. Right. And it just adds some, it just adds some fun to the game. And, and it, and in my opinion, it's a, it's a good example of, um, not being like really myopic in terms of like looking at just MMOs and saying, okay, what are all the MMOs right now doing? And so, you know, and drawing from that in terms of, you know, what we can put in a game and what we want it to, to be like, but, you know, drawing from all kinds of different games, you know, and like Breath of the Wild has really cool climbing and all that, you know, and like, wow, that's a neat experience, you know, what, what could we do with that in an MMO, you know, or, you know, looking at all kinds of different games from way back, you know, and just, uh, you know, throwing a bunch of stuff into the, the blender, right, that is, that is our, our consciousness, you know, and, and picking out what are good ideas from various places and how can that fit not trying to bring in, you know, force in a bunch of stuff, but just, you know, that's a cool idea. You know, we might actually be able to do something cool with that. And, you know, like verticality and dungeons and things like that, you know, where you, you climb up, you know, uh, a passage or something like that, instead of, you know, all being straight and on the same level or just like little ramps, you know, but actually having to climb down maybe, you know, and all that. And we've got like a cave right now, like a little thing, um, a small cave that's got a a bit of verticality to it, you know, where you have to, you come into the entrance and there's, there's basically a thing where you got to climb down, you know, in order to get into the cave further. And that, that just adds a component to it. uh, um, That verticality component that I think is just really cool. Um, And, and add something to the game, to the MMO space in general, I think. Yeah, it's not like climbing itself is new, but it's sort of how we're implementing it in the game that feels fresh because right. th- at, a, at a design level, uh, it's, you know, it's being thought of right from the get-go and, you know, it's not just something that's being added in later. Um, but right. it, anyway, uh, I, that's it from me. Ben, do you have any final questions for Steve? Oh, if I do, I'll ping him later. <laughs> Steve, thank you. I want to thank you so much. This was amazing. Uh, you know, as, as somebody who's been an MMO fan for years, it was great hearing about the history. I wish we had, an, you know, we could literally devote a whole episode just to talking about the EQ days. And, and I'd love to hear more of those stories. Maybe we'll, we'll hit you back up at another point. But thank you for taking the time to answer the questions today. It's been great to have you on as our first guest. Yeah, there's 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 entirely too much to that could be shared, you know, <laughs> lots of different things. How Quake almost killed the development. Um, <laughs> no, but it, <laughs> different, uh, lots of different stories. But uh, anyway, yeah, it's been great. Thanks, guys, for having me on. Well, we're, well, we're we've, got, go ahead, we've got more months. Ahead, we have months ahead of us before uh, before we launch. So um, so I'm sure we can we can pull you in again <laughs> for sure before and, that time. And uh, I, I think it's just awesome that we have you on the team, you know, again, as a as a fan uh, of your past work, but also kind of a fan of what you're doing for us now. So uh, thank you from, from me and thank you from Ben and thank you from the chat. Uh, the VIPs, I think, really appreciate you coming by. Uh, so yeah, thank you to all the VIPs out there. I mean, seriously, I, I wouldn't be on the team without you guys because, you know, I mean honestly it's like we wouldn't be able to do this without you guys you being passionate about this project uh and us being passionate about this project you know you help us make this go it's a team effort so thank you guys all righty well that's it from for this month uh but thank you guys and we'll catch you next month thanks everybody <laughs> <laughs>